Before we start, uh, let's just go to a word of prayer, and then we can begin. So uh, let's, let's pray. God, uh, I, I want to thank you um, just for this opportunity uh, to worship you, to come together as a community, and to listen to your word today. We ask you, Father, to just be in this place to convict us, to guide us into truth. We ask that we have an, an experience, an encounter with you in our minds and in our hearts. And I pray, Father, that as, as we leave this place, we will leave transformed or at the very least have something to think about. God, we just lift everything to you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you had the chance to relive a season in your life, what season would it be? If you were able to relive a moment, a moment in your life, what moment would that be? For me, it would be my childhood. I, I loved my childhood. Even to this day, sometimes I drive by my, my old house in Rundle. I drive by my school and I'm like, the memories? And I, I think about it a lot. You know, I loved my childhood. You know, my parents did a great job providing us with a great Childhood, I have nothing but fond memories. You know, we used to play hockey um, in our living room uh, in Rundle. We had this like, it was just like a small net, this red net. And we would, my dad got us a hockey sticks and got both of us, me and my brother, and we would play hockey. We would have so many games in our living room. It would be one-on-one. -on -one. So my brother against me and then my dad's in net. And we'd play this game where we would just do slap shots on each other. So I'd be in net, and we used this racket ball, this blue racket ball, it's this firm ball, and it's kind of hard, but not super hard. Has anyone ever played racket ball? This one, just Jeffrey. Okay, fine, that's okay. So we would play with it, and we would do slap shots, and I'd be in net, and my brother would do all these slap shots on me, and my sister, my little sister, she'd be like this cheerleader. So she'd be in the back, yeah, you know, she's just jumping around and, doing, and she'd be behind the net and just cheering us on. And this one time my brother did this massive slap shot. Bam! And I'm supposed to save it with my, you know, my hand. But I missed. And it hit my sister right in the eye. Boom! And she's like, you know, stunned, and she crumples on the ground. And after she was crying, after all the tears stopped, there was this black ring around her eye. And we started to laugh at her because it was so, we just thought it was so funny. And we would, we would laugh, and, and she didn't know why we were laughing because she was super young. She was like five years younger than me. And we just had all these great moments together. It was so fun. And the one thing I wish, I wish it was longer. You know, I wish my child, especially when I go to, well, not go to work, but especially when there's bills to pay and stuff. And I'm like, my gosh, I wish I was a kid again. But we all grew up. You know, we don't live together anymore. Me and my brother and my sister. You know, they, my, my sister has her own family. And then my parents, they're getting older too. And you're just more aware of how fast life goes. And, you know, over the years, I've started to lose friends. You know, I've seen people pass away. You know, I had a friend who passed away when she was 25. And we're like, what? 25? You're not, supposed to be, you're not supposed to die at 25. And you start seeing people, you know, get, get cancer. Or, you know, my two dogs, they, they passed away. 
And every time that happens, I'm, I'm confronted with this inconvenient truth. This truth that punches me in the gut, like it, it hurts. That life is short. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. So my question today is this, how do we respond to the brevity of life? How do we respond to the shortness of life? Like how do we make the most of the life that God has given us? So our passage today is from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9 to 10. I'm going to read it. If you, have your, if you have your Bibles, please open it. If you don't, it'll be up on the screen. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9 to 10. It says this, Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that is given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. You know, as we said in previous sermons, the, the teacher in our passage is not a Christian. Uh, he's more closer to an agnostic, yet he speaks with the culture's wisdom. But iron ironically, this is where the culture's wisdom is totally right. It matches with the biblical wisdom we find in the rest of the Bible. So to deal with the brevity of life, the shortness of life, we need to seize the day, of, seize the day for joy, and we need to seize the day for work. In the, the summer of 1993, I, I was eight, and I was enjoying my summer. I was having fun playing games. You know, playing Nintendo, the original one. And I think Super Nintendo just came out. But I was enjoying when all of a sudden I woke up with a terrible stomach ache. Yeah, it was on the side. Oh, gosh, do I have to go to the washroom? I, I didn't know what it was. So I went to the washroom, and I thought it was gone, but it wasn't. It was still there. So I was like, oh, I was complaining. Uh, there's something wrong with this, my, my right side. I was trying to ignore it, ignore it, but it, the worst, it got, it just got worse and worse. So my parents, they took me to the hospital, and I found out I had an appendicitis. The inflammation of the appendix. So I had to get surgery right away, because if it ruptures, it's possibly life-threatening. So I'm like listening to this as a kid. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm freaking out because I've never had surgery in my life. I've never had anyone cut me open. Yeah, I was just like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? So I was scared. This would be the first time I was going to enter a hospital, you know, this room full of doctors without my parents. And they put this thing on me, and I'm like breathing it in. They're like, it smells like pizza sauce. Don't worry. So I'm like, okay. And they're like breathing it in, and then I'm knocked out. Like, I don't remember anything. And I come back, and I wake up, and I'm in bed, and I'm in pain. So I got the surgery, and it sucked because I had to recover during my summer break. And for me, summer break is holy. It is a holy thing for me to have two months off. Can you, like you, if you're an adult right now, to have two months off would be like heaven, etern like eternal bliss. To have two months off in the summer. So it was a holy thing for me. So I was pretty mad that I had to stay in the hospital. There's not much you could do. I remember... Home Alone 2 came out on VHS. So I watched it in my hospital room bed with my roommate. 
And that's all we did. We were just lying in bed. I didn't like the hospital food. They gave us macaroni and cheese, but it wasn't Kraft macaroni and cheese. It was some different one. And I was so upset because it didn't taste the same. And I was just mad. And whenever I had to pee, I had to roll this huge IV machine into the toilet. Not into the toilet. Into the washroom. So it was uncomfortable. But then my friends came. Family would start visiting. Oh my gosh. You know, the best part is when the nurse is like, David, you have a visitor. Oh, who, who is it? And they came in, and everyone that came in had presents. I was like, oh my, oh my gosh, it's like a, a second birthday. So like, they came in presents. I got so many things. Look at that. I had a, I had a Chicago Bulls back-to-back t-shirt. I was like, oh my gosh. I got a troll doll. And back then, troll dolls were... Well, they were cool for me. I thought they were so cool. And it would talk to me at night. Like, it was like the best. And I was like, oh my gosh. So everyone was bringing food. I got, you know, that cookies at the back and balloons. Every, every, I was like, wow. It, I really appreciated it. You know, it, there's something to about when you know someone's thinking about you or when someone's, someone cares about you. And I was like, wow, people really love me. I was like, so, I was so happy. So I took a step back and I looked at everything and I was really thankful because if they didn't catch this uh, appendicitis in time, you know, my appendix might have burst, I could have died. So yes, there were some things that sucked. But when you really look, there were things to be thankful for. There were still things to have joy there's still blessings. You know, the author in our passage tells us that life will have toil. You should expect life to be hard. Okay? Like, that's a weird thing about today. It's like, everyone wants everything to be easy. But the Bible's very realistic. And it says, the, the, you know, as this passage says, life will have toil. There will be death. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose loved ones. Suffering will happen, and they can take things away. They can ruin your plans. They can ruin everything. Yet, we still need to enjoy life. We still need to find joy, even when things aren't perfect. It's actually an important spiritual discipline to find joy in life. You know, to have this habit of looking for joy, looking for the blessings. Because I promise you, the negative circumstances in your life so often can overcome and cloud your judgment. You know, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he sa- Paul says this, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. That rejoicing in the Lord keeps our hearts in the right place. We need constant reminders that God is good. Like when you see a sunset. You know, I just went to the mountains and I saw this beautiful lake. You know, we went hiking on Thursday. And I was like, wow, it's so clear, so beautiful. And when you're in the presence of friends or when you're eating good food, you know, let's remember what God has given you. Let's remember what God has given us, that it will strengthen your trust in him, especially when you're in the valleys. So let's enjoy God's goodness right now. Give thanks. You know, enjoy your parents right now. You know, we're, we're in such a hurry to grow up. I was just talking to Shala about this the other day. We're such in a hurry to grow up. We were talking about, like, when we were 17 and everyone was going to the clubs. And we're like, oh, why can't I go? And then we're talking about <laughs> Shala used this fake ID and she so that she could go. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like, we, we can't wait. Like, we just need to hurry, 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 hurry. Let's, let's grow up. And now that I, I've grown up, not physically, but I've grown up, it's like, Gosh, growing up sucks. It, 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 oh my gosh, I would love to be a kid again. 
Enjoy your kids. They're going to grow up. And you'll never have that same moment with them again. You know, I find myself looking at photos of my kids. You know, as they're growing up, you know, I will never have my son at five years old again. I will never have that again. Enjoy your friends. Enjoy your spouse. Soak up every good moment. Stay in the moment. We're so, we're always just thinking so far ahead. Stay in the moment and give thanks. Why? Because tomorrow's not guaranteed. It is not guaranteed. But we have to be clear. The Christian life is not solely about having fun. It's not solely about enjoying good food and having nice vacations. That is not the meaning of life. For Christians, yes, let's enjoy. Enjoyment is for strengthening us, giving us the strength to work. We're like, work? No. Strength to work. To make a difference in the world. Which leads to my next point, that we seize the day for work. They're like, ew, not work. Have you ever uh, seen, it's an old show, but have you ever seen Extreme Home Makeover? Come on, please. Yeah, please, this is not ghosts. I said ghosts, and no one watched ghosts ever. But anyways, so anyways, they, they kind of like renovate homes for families. Uh, so a family like shares their story, and it's usually sad. And then all these workers and designers, they come and they build them a new home. And the best part is the end. You know, they have that phrase. You guys remember it? Oh, thank God, one of them. Yes. <laughs> it's like, move that bus. And the, the bus, we like, ah! everyone's crying. It's like, oh, they're shocked. The mom is crying. There's boogers in her nose. And they're like, oh, I'm my room. And it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. I'm like, wow. All the work they put into it, and to see that reaction from the family, it's like the best part. It's so meaningful. It's so impactful. It's beautiful. When I was younger, we, we did something like that. But not to the same scale, okay? So don't say, whoa, did it? <laughs> Where did you get all that money at? No, we didn't do it at the same scale. Still nice. You know, our church was getting a, a youth pastor, and we were excited, and they were about to rent a, a duplex home, and they were going to move into it in two weeks. But the home wasn't in the best shape. You know, there was holes in the walls, paint coming off, Stains on the ceilings. There's brown stains on the carpet. It's like, oh, okay. So what our church did was we were going to surprise them by fixing up their house. They're like, oh my gosh, it won't be like a move that bus moment. Maybe, I don't know, move that door. I don't know. But it was, it was amazing. So we had to do it fast because we only had two weeks. So we had a strict timeline of two weeks, so we worked hard. We, we changed the carpet. You know, the church bought them a new carpet, and we changed the carpet. We repainted the walls. We fixed the ceiling. We were fixing everything. And when they came, we surprised them. Oh, come inside. <laughs> they opened the door. They were, like, oh, they were shocked. They were so happy. They were floored. That time limit of two weeks really pushed us to work hard, to work fast. We're like, oh my gosh, we don't have all the time in the world. Let's do this. This is what we need to realize. And I feel like we don't realize this enough. We don't have all the time in the world. We don't. We think we do, but we don't. We need to live with a time limit in mind. And this will cause us to live with purpose, purpose and focus. You know, at verse 10, he said, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. 
For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom shield to which you are going. This is what the teacher is saying. Life is short. It is short. And you're going to Sheol, which is the grave. Meaning, you're going to die. Sorry, I know that sounds not very happy, but it's truth. You're going to die, so you don't have all the time in the world. If you're going to do something, then commit to it. Work hard. Do not waste your life. This means taking our everyday work seriously. Whether it's paid or volunteer work, even things like raising children, helping at church, studying in school, whatever work that God has given you to do, you need to do it with all your strength. You know, we should have the best work ethic. If anything, if Christians are to be known, we should, have, we should be known for our work ethic. You know, Colossians 3, verse 23, it tells us this, whatever you do, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Now, this changes everything. This mindset changes everything. You're working for the Lord, not for human masters, not for your boss. You're working for the Lord. This, we need this type of approach to our work, whether it's paid or unpaid. Like, we are working for God. We should work hard, not lazy, giving a half-hearted effort. We need to realize that we are doing this for Jesus, that our work is an expression of our love for Jesus. This is hard. Because for most of us, we're not going to find full, complete satisfaction in our jobs. Even if you have a great job, you'll have bad days. You'll work with that person that you don't like. You know, at Sushi Boat, I worked with someone that was so slow. And I was like, God, every day. I was like, gosh, I was cleaning, and I would catch up to her. We were supposed to meet in the middle to clean. And every single time, and every single, I'd, I'd be super upset. All of us have someone in our workplace. <laughs> Yet, we are called to have the right mindset. To have this mindset, a Christian mindset, to see the value of your work. This is tough because I promise you, especially on Monday, when you don't want to be there, or when you work and you don't see any fruit from your labor. It is hard. It is actually a type of suffering. It was a type of suffering. It's not always comfortable. No one likes to suffer. You know, if I said, come on, we are called to suffer. Would everyone be like, yeah, let's do it. None of you. No one would. It's not comfortable. But you have to remember that when we work, we are serving people whom God loves. You're building skills. You're building gifts. You're building character. You have a chance to build relationships with people at work that could lead to spiritual conversations. This is a fact. And it needs to be said, God cares about your work. God cares about your work. God cares about your attitude towards your work. If you can rightly connect your work to the things of God, it's like faith and work, faith and work. If you can connect, connect it rightly to the things of God, everyone will be better for it. You know, the people you serve, you, can, you will be happier. The problem is, we don't make that connection. We have work here and then faith here, and then we just leave it there. We don't, what's the word? Integrate it. Like, we don't connect it. We're only concerned with our own comfort. 
So if you have a job, consider it a high priority to make that connection. Oh, it's going to be hard. You might not like it. We have to make it a high priority to make that connection. Work in the things of God. Work in the things of God. Only then will you encounter God in your workplace. Earlier, I, I, I asked, how do you respond to the brevity of life? How do you respond to the shortness of life? We need to seize the day for joy. We have to. In the midst of good and bad circumstances, we need to realize that there's always joy to be found. We need to enjoy these moments. Stay in the moment. Soak it up and give thanks to God because it all comes from Him. This is how we learn to trust Him. And when we trust Him, then we can seize the day for work. Whether you have a job or if you're studying at school or is it some random work around the house, it's all for God. Our moments are limited. So let's take every chance we get to make a difference because what we do here, it matters. It matters. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your word today. That, Father, as I grow in age, I just see how short life is the brevity of life. And Father, you know, as I've, you know, lost friends and I've seen so many things and now my parents are older, God, help us to seek joy in the moments, the moments that you have given us. I pray, Father, we can just thank you for it and we can stay in the moment, Lord. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. So, Father, help us to seek joy. I pray that we could do that. So that when we seek joy, we can work. Since time is limited, we could work, find good work, so we could make a difference. Father, help us change our attitudes towards work. Help us connect the things of God to our work. And I pray, Father, that you will be with us, you'll strengthen us. And God, I just want to give everything to you today. In your name we pray. Amen.